Hey everybody, um, like I said, my name is Jonathan, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about protein structure prediction. Oh, wait, uh, maybe I was using the wrong uh, first slide there, but you know, if only there was a way that we could easily translate languages, you know, maybe something like Google Translate. Oh, that's great. So if, if you don't speak Chinese, I don't, you can just use Google Translate and you can figure out that I'm actually going to be talking to you today about how to predict protein structure using language translation techniques. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about this and there's been a lot of development in language translation techniques and I'll try to talk about how that is related. But first, let's go over some biology. So oh, I, should, I should really say that my project is actually about how Google Translate is going to write my thesis. So anyways, back, back to the biology. So here's a really cool uh, diagram of what a cell might look like in reality. It's, it's a cartoon, but it really goes to demonstrate how densely packed cells are. And other than these yellow items here, which are DNA and the green, which are some extracellular components, everything else in this picture is a protein. And it's doing uh, really important work to keep the cell alive. And the function that proteins play is actually entirely dependent on what their 3D shape is. And to, just to get into a little bit more details about this, uh, proteins are linear chains of amino acids. So here we see a, a chain of amino acids. Here's one, here's another. And then each amino acid is differentiated by the kind of side chain that's attached to it. So this great part of the chain we would call the backbone. And all these colored parts here are the amino acid side chains. And there are about 20 different amino acids, and each of them with a unique side chain will fold together in 3D space to create a unique shape for that protein, which determines its uh, complete function. Now, another way you can look at the protein structure is by drawing it like this. So here are these helix shapes represent the backbone of the protein, while all these stick figures kind of hanging off the side of the backbone are the side chains that I talked about. Now, the bad thing about proteins is if they ever stop working, you know, that, that could lead to a lot of disease or medical issues. And then, in fact, a lot of drugs are designed to be able to interact with proteins by binding to their side chains. And a protein structure is, is so important for this because if you know the shape of the, the protein, you can design a drug that will be able to bind to the right spot and change the behavior of the protein. Now, unfortunately, even though protein structures are super important, they're extremely expensive. And in fact, this, uh, the red part of this graph shows the total number of protein structures over time. And the blue part of the graph shows the total number of protein sequences over time. As you can see, there's far fewer protein sequences available than our protein structures. And a large part of this has to do with the fact that the experiment that can produce what a protein structure looks like can cost tens of thousands of dollars. And sometimes it doesn't even work. I went to go update these numbers um, just based on this month alone. And so as of March 2020, there were 170 million protein sequences, but only 155,000 protein structures. And so because of this issue, for the past several decades, people have been trying to take protein structure, sorry, protein sequence information and use that to predict what proteins might actually look like to fill in this gap. There's a couple ways that people have been working over the past few decades to do this. The first and most like, iconic way that you could try to figure out what a protein looked like is by using something called molecular dynamics. And in molecular dynamics, you take a protein sequence and you basically simulate it, and the protein vibrates and jostles around until you, the physics involved will maybe show you like, what the right structure is. But this is really computationally expensive and it takes weeks of computation for a single protein and at the end you're not even sure if it's correct. 
Another set of methods are called fragment or template-based assembly. And in these kinds of methods, you say, well, I don't know what this protein looks like, but I know what a lot of its similar proteins do look like. So you can try to compare it with ones that you know that are similar, but if there's any small difference between them, your prediction might be wrong because all it takes is like a single mutation on the protein for it to completely unfold. And so these, these methods in particular are for accounters for that. So this brings me to the obvious next question and why we're here today, and this is, you know, what about deep learning? What, can machine, what role can machine learning play in solving this problem? So I'll talk a little bit about that. So if you've um, been paying attention to some of the news about um, biology or proteins and machine learning, you may have seen this graphic. This comes from Google when they participated in the critical assessment of protein structure prediction contest. So in this contest, people meet every two years and they try to make predictions for proteins. And um, in 2019, uh, DeepMind had a team that participated in this contest. And for it was their first time participating and they used a complete, uh, like complete machine learning um, method and they basically blew everyone out of the water. They beat everybody by an extreme margin and everyone was really surprised and frankly, a little jealous. Um, and this method works by predicting these potentials, which kind of you can interpret as energy and it kind of makes the protein fold on its own. Uh, another important method that I'll be talking about is one that uses something called recurrent neural network. The recurrent neural networks take their input as sequence elements one at a time. So here's the protein sequence coming in at the bottom. And for each protein sequence element, these represents amino acids, they will produce a few angles. And from those angles, you can build out the amino acid. However, uh, recurrent neural networks are notoriously slow to train. In addition, um, this method that was published uh, used a lot of uh, extra information, which may be helpful and also, when they participated in this contest, at first, because of the way they trained it, they used a loss called distance-based root mean square distance. When they optimized for this value, which represents how good a structure is, they actually caused the model to make predictions for angles that were so unrealistic that they got rejected by the contest automatically. So even though the predictions from this model looked pretty good, uh, in reality, there was something wrong with the angles. So this brings me to uh, kind of address, you know, where, where, can, where can I fit in in this? And what, what is my uh, research project trying to address? Well, the first major shortcoming, which is true for uh, most of the methods that I just described, is that they do not predict the side shape atoms for simplicity. So they're only predicting the backbone atoms. And maybe this is just because the problem is really hard and people haven't developed solutions to address this yet. But I would argue that a model that does not predict the side chain atom is at a severe disadvantage. And this is because, like I was saying earlier, um, side chain atoms are what make the protein unique. They're what cause the protein to help fold onto itself, to um, make these interactions, the side chain atoms are what dictate what the protein does, is how you can design medicines. And so if you're ignoring this information, it might be a detriment to the model. And also you won't be able to do things that are important like design drugs. Uh, the second shortcoming that I'll try to address is the fact that the current neural networks, uh, I don't think have the right inductive bias for this task. So it's true that the method that Muhammad Karashi that I just mentioned, his method worked relatively well for getting good structures, but because recurrent neural networks operate on a sequence element one piece at a time, they're not able to really remember things that are very far apart. So I think that's really important for proteins because you'll have amino acids that are very far apart in the sequence, but they'll fold up together in the 3D space. And I think that that deserves a special model architecture, which I'll talk about in a little bit. 
Okay, so now that I've covered a little bit of the basics on why I'm here, um, I'll go into a little more detail. So first I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, how I've made an all atom predictive model. So one that predicts both the side chain atom, the backbone atoms, the protein. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about what it takes to make a training set for this information. And then finally, I'll go over just some preliminary results that I have so far. Okay, so first of all, you know, what does this have to do with language translation? Uh, so that's the primary uh, inspiration for this project, I would say. And so basically, I think since 2014 or 2017, uh, language translation tools hit a huge milestone. I don't know if you know, if you've ever played with Google Translate before 2014, it was not super great, but ever since then, people developed machine learning methods that really make it really amazing. And it has to do with you know, deep learning and being able to transform sequences of one type into sequences of another. And so I thought, you know, if I could frame this problem of predicting protein structure as language translation, then I could use all of the methods that they're using to make this so successful. So in order to do this, I'm treating the input, my input language as a sequence of amino acids. So here's one character. And the output language after it goes through the machine learning model is a sequence of angles. So here I have symbols representing all the what we call torsional angles for this amino acid. So you can see they dictate how the amino acid is shaped. And they even uh, describe the positions of all the side chain atoms. So we translate the language from the input to the output, one amino acid at a time. And then we can use this and continue to predict the entire protein structure in angles. We can use a straightforward algorithm to build one at a time the Cartesian coordinates that represent the protein. And then we have an actual 3D structure of the protein. And in order to train the model, we compare this prediction with the true protein structure prediction, and we use a loss function, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, in order to improve the model's predictions over time. All right, and the great thing about deep learning is that all of these operations, even the ones that take the angles and turn them into coordinates, all of these operations are completely differentiable. So, all, so we can use machine learning to optimize this whole, whole prediction setup. So I'll, I'll go into a little more detail about um, the exact model that I'm using. So uh, hopefully if you're uh, you know, interested in deep learning lately, uh, since 2017, you've heard about this model called the transformer model. And it's really changed the field for uh, language translation, for natural language processing, um, and for se sequence, uh, sequence prediction in general. So basically, um, this is a transformer model, has two parts, it has an encoder and a decoder. And rather than a recurrent neural network, which operates by looking at a sequence one piece at a time, the transformer uses something that called attention, and it looks at the entire sequence at the exact same time. And this is the, the main difference. And so if we were to, to show you an example of like what this would look like if we were using languages, uh, here's, here's a sentence. And um, for part of the sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it. And here's the same sentence um, repeated here. And all these lines that connect the two columns, those are what we would call attention weights. So if the uh, line is darker, that means that there's a stronger weight between those two words. So what this is telling us is that um, we'll have a transformer model, which will actually predict these attention weights, and what it's predicting is that, I, you know, I think that the word it is strongly re related to animal or street, you know, because they're, they're nouns, and, you know, maybe it's related to the and it. And so this is what an attention layer does. It tries to predict what things are going to interact. And this is, this is perfect. This is exactly what we would want for protein structure. We want to know which amino acids are going to interact. We want to know which ones are close in the 3D space, which ones are far apart. And so that's why I was using, it, using this model. However, I, was, I did make uh, 
did make one main change to the transformer model. And I would love feedback on that if you guys have any. But I decided to throw away the entire second half of the transformer model. And I was doing some reading. And I think that when you translate from one language to another, you don't know the difference in the sent sentence lengths. Like for instance, if you, you say a sentence in English and you translate it into Spanish, the, you know, the translation might mean the same thing, but it will have a different number of words. And that's one of the main reasons why people have an encoder and a decoder. So is that a decoder can take the information and it can figure out when it's done predicting. However, for proteins, this is not the case. Like we, we know that there's exactly the same number of words in the input language as there are in the output language. And so I, that's why I've just thrown away the decoder and we'll see how far I can get with that. Okay, so the next step is the training set to do, to do this. Okay, so unfortunately, I don't need to start from scratch. There is this great thing called ProteinNet, which you can see on GitHub. It's made by the previous author I mentioned, Mohammed al Qureshi. And ProteinNet is based on that contest I was telling you about, CAT. And so this is what it looks like. So here is uh, on this axis this time. So at this point, we have the, um, the deadline for the contest. And here is the actual meeting. So what Mohammed does is he says, okay, everything that happened, all the structures that we know that are available before the meeting, we're going to make the training set for that meeting. And they're going, and then he takes out a couple pieces, of the training set and calls out the validation set. And then um, the structures that they compare with each other at the actual contest, those will be the test structures. So the reason this is really helpful is that, you know, one of it's really hard to design a really good machine learning data set. You know, what's the test set going to be like? Are you going to randomly select items from your training set to, to be the test set? And in this case, because there's a contest every two years, we, if you just copy exactly what the contest is doing, then all this is, is handled for you. You know, every two years, the, the organizers, they come up with a list of really, really difficult proteins and they make a test set. So Mohammed went back to every uh, cast competition that's happened for a while, and he made these uh, training sets for them. The only problem is that they do not include any information about sidechain atoms. So I went through the big list of sidechains, which are kind of shown here. I've color coded them. Um, this kind of like shows the complexity of all the different sidechains you can have. You know, they have a different number of um, atoms here, each little set of two letters is a different atom type. Um, they take on different shapes. And so basically, I made a data set that's based off of ProteinNet, but uh, includes all of this information. So if you have a protein whose length is L, uh, there could be at most 13 atoms for that protein, and each atom has an X, Y, and Z coordinate. So that's part of the input. Um, and the output language, if you remember, are angles. So if you go and measure all these angles, um, you can get up to 12 different angles for every acid. And then actually, if you go one step further, you know, this whole thing is about trying to predict angles first, right? So I, I got to reading some research papers that said, you know, instead of trying to predict the angle in radians, which is common, you know, like pi, two pi, that kind of thing, you can actually predict angles as sine or cosine. And the reason this is like important is because for a machine learning model, it doesn't really understand that pi and negative pi, um, those angles are exactly the same, right? You have to use some sort of uh, fancy loss function to account for that. But a trick from the signal processing community is to actually just use these, um, these items and parentheses here. These are the sine and cosine positions, which represent uh, the x and x and y coordinates on the unit circle. And actually, if you predict these, you can get better performance than just predicting uh, radians in, in case you ever have to deal with angles in the future. Okay, so I made this data set. You have to, you have to go into all the proteins. You know, here's like an example. Um, you have to go and measure the angles just right. And you know, if you 
you have a negative sign or if you swap sign and cosine, you know, like I did here when I was making it, you could make a tiny mistake that could make a big difference. And so that's what I've been working on for a while. Okay, moving on. So there's the, now we have a model that can predict all the atoms of the protein. We have a data set, which is based off of an existing data set, but includes all the information we need. And finally, we'll talk about, uh, you know, what, it, what it's been like to train this. It's been really hard. It's, I have not had really great results, to be honest. This is apparently a difficult problem, and hopefully I'm not the only person who has I mean, run into this problem. Um, so here is an actual prediction, uh, sorry, uh, the actual structure of a protein. It's a very simple protein. It's just an alpha helix. I just tried to train on this one alpha helix, and I didn't get something that looked very great. These top three lines here represent the loss I was talking about, DR and SD, which measures the structural similarity between them. And they're really high. You know, this dotted line uh, is around two. And if they were at two, that would be good, but they're not. So I've, I've been working out ways to try to fix this for a, a long time. Okay, so this is just another thing that I learned that might be interesting to uh, anyone. Let's see, I'm, I'm using the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you for the, uh, thank you for the support in the chat there. Okay, I had that window hidden. Okay, sorry, just to continue. Um, if you're working with transformers, this next piece of information, maybe you know, maybe you don't, but I didn't know this until I took the class that told me that it was wrong. Okay, so this is a picture of the transformer model. Okay, there in here we see something called add and norm. So add and norm means you take the value from this part of the graph, you add it to the output of this part of the graph, and then you do a, a layer normalization step. So like if you were to write it out, you take the input plus the feed forward layer, and then you take a layer along with that. Okay, so this is what's in the paper, but did you know that this is not what you should probably do? What you should actually do is move the arrow so that you add after you do the layer norm. Okay, so this is the X plus, this is called a residual connection. And residual connections are supposed to help your model train by having like a shortcut from the output of a layer um, all the way to the back, the beginning of the layer, right? And unless you have it written like this, the gradient information will have more trouble uh, propagating through the layer norm. Okay, so th just a tip, and that's something I learned and I helped my model a lot when I was training. Okay, um, so the next thing I'll talk about that I, uh, that I found out recently is that the idea of using transformers was, you know, may maybe it's good, but in actuality it wasn't working that well. So I was thinking, you know, in a tension layer, the good thing is that it can figure out if an amino acid over here is interacting with an amino acid over here. But it doesn't compare amino acids that are right next to each other very well. If, it won't, if a word and the following word are very similar, then, uh, you know, it, it won't do that comparison as well as a recurrent neural network. So one thing I decided to do was add something called a sequence convolution. Okay, so a sequence convolution is kind of depicted on the left here. So if you have your sequence in blue, here this is just integers, you can take a, a filter, a convolutional filter or a, a, a window, and you can pass it over the sequence. And at each point in time, you uh, compute the convolution. So this would, the output is one, one because you have one, one times one plus negative one times zero plus zero times two. And if you sum all those values together, you get uh, the output of the convolution layer. Okay. So my, my idea was if I, maybe if I add convolution, sequence convolutions to this modified transformer, you know, maybe I can pick up information like these, uh, this alpha helix here. 
know, maybe you can recognize that these amino acids are close to each other and it can uh, you know, figure out that there's supposed to be an alpha here. Okay, so uh, that, that was the idea. I'll show you what happened. And so to, to inspect this, I use the weights and biases report. And I'm happy to show you this. I, I made this recently. And so you, when you do a project on weights and biases, you can kind of make a little write-up for yourself and you can you know, do an experiment and share it with people. That's what I'm trying to do now. Okay, so regarding my, see, uh, let's see, David. Sorry, I think, I think my audio is on. Um, okay, good, good to know. I'll, I'll get- We can hear you, Jonathan. Okay, great. Let me, uh, I'll just finish this up and then I'll, make sure I have time for questions at the end. Thanks everyone. Okay, so I wanted to know if adding a convolution to my transformer model would help. And so this is what the, that's the experiment I'm doing here. So I added convolution with windows of size three and size 11. And I also ran a model that had no sequence convolution at all. And so this blue line that you see here on the top is when a model is trained out any convolution layers. The green and purple are when you add a convolution who has a filter size of three and the orange and yellow are when you have a convolution that has a filter size of 11. So this is great. It's, it's showing that if I add convolution layers, you know, maybe I can improve the performance in the transform. And so here, here are some really basic predictions. Um, the red is the, is the predicted helix and the blue is the actual one. And you can see they all look perfectly fine, except for this one in the lower left corner, which happens to be the one without a convolution layer. So it had trouble without the helix. So maybe, you know, maybe that's showing something. Here's a couple more examples of some proteins that were predicted, um, but it's not, it's not exactly clear from the pictures you know, how, just how good this is getting. Okay, we'll go on a little bit. So it's great to know that adding a sequence convolution can help to transform, but I got to thinking, you know, uh, given that we're, that this has to do with language translation, you know, one of the biggest parts of the transformer model or language translation models are, um, you know, an embedding layer. And so an embedding layer is something that takes a high dimensional version of a word. So you take a word, you know, apple, and it, you know, it's, it's word number 7,000 out of 40,000. And so it's a huge vector, it's a high dimensionality, and you pass it through an embedding layer and you get a smaller vector that represents that word. And this is like really critical to help machine learning models that work with languages uh, understand you know, what the meaning of the words are. And so this, this is something that I have in the transformer model, but you know, do, we know, uh, do we know that this is important? Like for instance, there's only 20 different amino acids. There's not like 100,000 amino acids. So do I, do we even need to add embedding layers at all? And so that's, this, that's the exact sort of thing I tried to answer with this next experiment. So here is uh, another big chart. Let's pull it up here. Um, on, on the right side, you can see that I ran maybe 12 different models with different um, convolution settings. And I also turned the embedding layer on and off. And so the great cool thing about weights and biases is that you can pull up the start and you can group all the runs by whether or not they were using the embedding. And so this, this is another chart that shows the performance over time. And we see that the orange chart, which is the use embedding, is higher than the blue, which is, uh, I'm sorry, the orange represents uh, no embedding and the blue represents using embedding. So there's a significant improvement when you add an embedding. And I thought that was great. 
Okay. Oops. Move on here. Um, so then, then I was thinking, you know, even though this is telling me that we have many more, um, or sorry, that the embedding is really helpful, it, is it just the fact that there's so many parameters in these models? Like for instance, this is this correlation in importance is telling me that the biggest difference between these is the fact that the, the models that have embedding layers just have more parameters. And so maybe that's the reason why they're improving. And so I did one more experiment. And so in this experiment, I tested three models. The purple model has an, an embedding layer. And the brown and the green models do not have embedding layer. But the difference between the brown and the green is that I tried to increase the number of parameters in, in the green so that it would have the exact same number of parameters. But this shows that even though you try to increase the number of parameters to be the same, the embedding layer is still really important. Okay, so that's, that's one other thing I, I learned in my recent research project and weights and biases has allowed me you know, to visualize these predictions. They're still not as good as I would hope, but you know, they're, I, I, I hope that they're on, on their way. And another cool thing that I'm looking forward to using in weights and biases is this thing called weights and biases dot molecule where you can visualize all the different uh, amino acids of your prediction as you go on. Okay, so that was a little bit of divergence, but um, you know, in, in the future, I'll be hoping to publish this sidechain net with this data set that I'm using so other people can potentially contribute. I think one other really important thing that might help these predictions is to incorporate some realistic uh, behavior, like some, some physics perhaps, um, or maybe 3D convolutional neural networks can help the model make better predictions over time. So uh, thank you so much for, for your patience and for uh, listening to me as I describe this uh, tough machine learning problem. And I you know, thank you, so thank, thanks to my uh, research group. Here's my research group. Uh, thank you to Nick and Lavanya for their help from Weights and Biases, and some Muhammad al Qureshi. Um, whose work is really inspiring. And thank you again for listening. Feel free to follow me on Twitter or GitHub. And I, I'm now happy to answer any questions. Uh, so I have some questions that I pulled out for you, Jonathan. Um, someone asked, uh, is your notebook available publicly? And I'm curious how you created the graphics. Yeah, the notebook is available publicly. Um, you can find like a permanent link on, on my Twitter. Um, or we can we can share it in the chat. And uh, was the question, how did I create the graphics? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these graphics can be made automatically with weights and biases, which is really nice. Um, these graphics are three D objects. Um, I use a software called PyMole to visualize the predictions, and then PyMole will export a three D object file, which you can then save to weights and biases. Uh, cool. Someone else asked, why do we need a sequence model? Uh, well, I think a sequence model makes uh, good sense for this problem because the input is um, all, like, all the information we have is the protein sequence. So at some part, we have to have the sequence. It's true that the, the output is three-dimensional, um, so maybe we could use something that's different there, but, I, but definitely for the beginning, a sequence model. Thanks. And then someone else asked, uh, would graphs be better uh, than doing RNN uh, or convolutions or combined approach? Would that be more helpful? Um, he thinks it might, this might be framed as a graph problem. So do you have some thoughts around that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great uh, idea. People have had a lot of success using graphs for uh, small molecules, I know. Like you can take a, a drug, turn it into what looks like a graph, and try to predict properties about that drug. And you can also do this with proteins, but that's a, it's a much bigger graph. And so it, it would take, I think, a lot of, a lot of work like, to get this data uh, into that format, but I don't, I don't see why that's, that would, like, I, I, I would be optimistic about its performance. Thanks. Uh, someone asked, um, are you dealing with uh, 3D protein side chains? How do you deal with them? How are they represented? 
Yes, I am. I am dealing with the three D protein side chains. Um, I I work with them by when I take the true structure, I measure all the angles that the side chain has, and I measure where it is in three D space. And then um, when I make the prediction, I try to re recreate those correct angles. And uh, <clears throat> there is an algorithm that lets you take angles and turn them into 3D structures. And uh, but that's not any machine learning in that algorithm. Uh, cool. And then the last question, if you don't use a decoder, what are your sanity checks to find out that your encodings are correct? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, well, in my case, the encoding is actually the, the entire answer. Um, so right in, a, in an encoder decoder model, you make an encoding which represents the, um, the output, but it's not yet the output. In my case, I, when I encode it, I am directly producing the output. And I, I haven't thought about looking at the layer in between, but um, that might be a good idea to visualize that. Cool. Those are all the questions we had. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, everybody.